Amen. Thank you, Ronnie. Today's scripture reading, I think, is very appropriate not only for celebrating the beginning of a journey, but for remembering and celebrating the end of one as well. It's found in Galatians chapter 3, starting in verse 27. It said, For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ like a garment. There is no Jew, no Greek, no slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to his promise. Let's pray. Father, we love you, Lord, and we just thank you. We thank you, Father, for new beginnings, and we thank you for endings that are bittersweet. Bitter for us, but sweet because we know that they are in your presence. And Father, I just pray that you will help us, Lord. Help us to be servants of yours. Help us, Lord, to take your gospel to this world that we live in. And help us, Father, in everything that we do to glorify and honor you. It's in your holy, wonderful, and amazing name we pray, Lord. Amen. I have to commend the sound booth because uh, I was in such a hurry to get up here to sing that uh, I went completely out of order and they had to find where I was up in the program that I put upstairs. <laughs> but I'm kind of glad that I do, did go out of order because as, as I uh, sang that song, I don't know that I could have come right back up here and began singing hymns again uh, because that... It touched me. Let's go ahead and stand and sing Because He Lives. Because he lives, I can find 
cause he lives all fear is gone because I know oh, he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he Hallelujah to the Lord of 
heaven and earth. Hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth. Hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth. God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy. Lord of heaven and earth. Lord of heaven and earth. Father God, we praise your mighty name. We thank you so much for that gift that you gave us 2,000 years ago in the form of Jesus Christ, Father. You offered that gift of salvation to us so that we could spend eternity with you, Father. You are the Lord of heaven and earth. God of wonders beyond our galaxy, Father. But yet, Father, you care about me. And each one of these people in the service today, each one who's watching on Facebook, you care about all of us as individuals. Father, I ask that you would just anoint this service, Father. We pray and we thank you for everything that you have done for us. We ask, Father, that you would just bless the sermon that you have given Nash. And thank you already for that gift of salvation that Chloe has received, Father God. We thank you so much for all your many blessings. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. to turn it on down here. There we go. As I was saying, we've heard some wonderful truths today. What a friend we have in Jesus. And 
what an awesome heritage it is to have praying parents. And I think we see the results of praying parents and grandparents in Miss Chloe. I tell you, that'll preach, folks. That really will. A couple of Wednesdays ago, I was talking with Chloe. We were walking actually along the front of the church here, and she pointed down to a big rock out there. Have y'all seen that big rock out there? And she said, Brother Nash, what's that for? I looked at it, and I said, well, that's a commemorative rock. It's, it's, it's from a passage in 1 Samuel, um, I believe it's chapter 7, verse 12, where you know Samuel named the stone Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. The Hebrew word Ebenezer literally means a stone of help, and it was a memorial stone erected by Samuel to remember when God helped defeat the Philistines. Now, everything I told her was true, but I wasn't real happy with my response. Okay, it didn't really say much. It said the truth, but it really didn't give that message of what that stone really stands for. But I've really been, since that day about a week and a half ago, I've been thinking a lot about stones, right? This is a stone, just a rock. What does this stand for? What does this mean? Well, it depends, doesn't it? You know, the reality is stones can be a lot of different things. I have a lot of very fond memories learning to skip stones with my brother. It's one of the first things I remember him teaching me. My brother Steve was my best friend growing up. And we spent a whole lot of time plunking rocks in the water. Some of them skipped, some of them didn't, but we had a good time. You know, when I see a stone, I also am reminded of the fact that um, God created me just as he wanted me, and he created me clumsy. These things will make you trip if you're not careful, won't they? I remember a Peanuts cartoon that I read in the newspaper one day. In the first frame, it had a picture of Charlie Brown. It just made this colossal swing, and the umpire was there saying, strike three. I'm familiar with that one, too. But the next portion of the comics had Charlie Brown sitting there and just saying, oh, rats, I'm never going to be a major league ball player. I've wanted to do that all my life, and I just, I just don't have it. I'm never going to make it there. Well... His ever-present friend Lucy was sitting next to him in the next frame. It says, look, Charlie Brown, you need to be making shorter-term goals. Okay, don't worry about what's going to happen way down the line. Let's, let's make a shorter-term goal. Like, how about in this next inning, when you go out to that mound to pitch, how about you try to get all the way to the mound without falling down? <laughs> Sounds like a good goal to me, right? Stones can be problematic, <laughs> as can carpets and painted lines on the floor or whatever. I can trip over anything. Some people, when they see a stone, all they see is something to throw at an enemy. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, David made pretty good use of a stone against Goliath, right? But I think any time we look at something and the first thing we see is a weapon should cause us some pause, wouldn't you think? Some people, when they, they, they see a stone, they see, man, that would just look beautiful lining a garden path. Stones can mean a lot of different things. You know, while I was thinking about stones, I ran across this poem. It says, isn't it strange that princes and kings and clowns that caper in sawdust rings and common people like you and me are builders for all eternity? Each of us is given a bag of tools, a shapeless mass, and a book of rules. And each must build ere life is flown a stumbling block or a stepping stone. That's our life, folks. What, what are you going to make of your life? Are you going to make a stumbling block for people? Or are you going to create yourself into a stepping stone so people that can see something greater than yourself? And when I say greater than yourself, you know I mean God. Folks, that's what we really should be shooting for. But it, the, the, the reality is in this thing called life, we're going to encounter a lot of things a lot of people and a lot of emotions and a lot of attitudes that really can be represented as stones in our life, okay? Things like habits and traditions, victories and failures, friends that lift you up and honestly, friends that let you down. We're going to encounter all of these things in life. And, and, and if we think of all of these things as stones, we need to decide what we're going to do with the stones in our life. 
Motivational author William Arthur Ward once said a a common sense statement about the way we live together in our world. He says, we can choose to throw stones, to stumble on them, to climb over them, or to build with them. See, those first three choices of of stumbling or or throwing or climbing over, that's really our fleshly response to things in life, right? But that fourth choice is by far the better one, to use them to build with them. That's the voice of God in our lives. And every step we take on this earth, there's a tension between are we going to listen to our flesh or are we going to listen to our Savior? Because let me tell you, those two messages are rarely the same. Which one should we listen to? God's. Boy, it's easy to say. It's kind of hard to do, isn't it? In Jesus' time, they had stones too. They had habits. They had traditions. They had people that lift you up. They had people that let you down. They had victories. They had failures, just like we do. For the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at how Jesus handled the stones in his life through studying the story of the woman at the well. It's found in John chapter 4, so turn with me, if you will, there to John chapter 4. And I know you might be thinking to yourself, what in the world does a woman at the well have to do with stones? I'll be honest with you, when God gave this to me, I was thinking the exact same thing. What? But I tell you, God will give you the words you need when you need them. And that's a good thing. That's a great thing. So let's read together. John chapter 4, the first nine verses. We're going to break this up into two parts. Really, today we're just going to talk about Jesus and this Samaritan woman at the well meeting. And then next week we're really going to unpack the entirety of their conversation. But for today we're just going to look at the first nine verses. Verse 1 starts, When Jesus knew that the Pharisees had heard, he was making and baptizing more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. He left Judea. And went again to Galilee. He had to travel through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the property that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about six in the evening. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, for his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, Ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, she asked him. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord, and we again just thank you so much for the many gifts and blessings you give us every single day. Father, I just pray that you will help us as we face the stones in our lives, Lord. Help us, Lord, to use them to build your kingdom and nothing else. Help us, Father, to be obedient to you in everything that we do. I pray, Father, you will hide this man behind your cross and speak through these lips of clay. Not my words, Lord, but yours. It's in your holy, wonderful, and amazing name we pray, Lord. Amen. I tell you, stories are powerful things, aren't they? I mean, really, this story in particular, it just, it sticks, right? It, it sticks in your heart, it sticks in your mind, it sticks in your soul, and it really gives us it gives us. It encourages us to reflect about some pre- presuppositions and prejudices that we might have. It, it encourages us reflection about the mission of Jesus, worship and belief and commitment. It offers a wonderful example for us to consider the nature and the strategy of our evangelistic outreach. And the reference to water and spirit really does harken back to the discussions that we've already had in the book of John in chapters 2 and 3. And again, like I've already said, this week we're just going to look at this introduction. Next week we're going to unpack the entire conversation. But they really do work together beautifully. All right, the first three verses. Jesus decides that it's time to make a move, right? He decides it's time for him to move on from Jerusalem. It's time for him to move on and go to Galilee. Why? Why, why, did, why did he feel it necessary to leave Judea? I mean, he was having big success, right? We talked last week about numbers and, and how he was, he was reaching people, right? He was, he was even challenging John's ministry. That's not what Jesus was all about. He wasn't all about the numbers, right? People were responding to his teachings, but so were the Pharisees. 
You know, this, this effectiveness in his teaching ministry really was a double-edged sword. It had some wonderful things to it. People coming to know Jesus as Messiah is a phenomenally wonderful thing, but then the Pharisees were also starting to sit up and take notice. And, and just like the miracle at, at the wedding in Cana, Jesus says, my time has not yet come. It's not time for a showdown with the Pharisees. And, and, and so he made a move. But know this. He didn't make a move just because of the pressures of men. He didn't make a move because of something he saw in his circumstances. Why do you think Jesus made a move? Because he had a divine appointment. He had an appointment to keep. Jesus left Judea and headed to Galilee. That, that's logical, right? Galilee is home, if you will, for Jesus, right? His family resettled in Nazareth after he was born in Bethlehem. They fled to Egypt. And then when the angel of the Lord came to Joseph and said, it's okay to come on home now, they came and they settled in Nazareth. So it makes perfect sense that, that Jesus would want to head home, right? And, and those of us, if you know the word, you know, how, what was his reception like when he got home? Not good. Aren't you that carpenter's boy? But he wanted to go. But he had a choice here. Right, verse 4 tells us he had to travel through Samaria. That's the whole verse. He had to travel through Samaria. Is that a true statement? No, it's not. The journey from Judah to Galilee can take three to four days if you take the direct route, or if you take the regular normal route, it takes six to seven days. What's the difference in the two? Normally what people would do is they'd cross the Jordan River and they'd travel north on the east side of the river. Did they do that because the journey was easier? No. The land on both sides of the river was about the same. Did they do it because it was shorter? No, it doubled the time of the journey. Why in the world would they double the time of their journey? Well, to stay away from the lousy Samaritans. Because, man, they were just awful. We, we don't want to have anything to do with them, so we will go way out of our way just to avoid them lousy Samaritans. I'll be honest with you, we have some racial issues in our country that we live in today, in the world we live in today. There are serious racial issues that need to be addressed. I mean, we're a lot better than we used to be, and I thank God for that, but we're not where we need to be either. But let me tell you, the racial issues that we're experiencing in the 21st century in the United States of America are nothing compared to the relations between the Jews and the Samaritans back in Jesus' time. So why? why? Why is this, this, this big argument between them? Well, you have to look all the way back into 2 Kings chapter 17, around 722 BC when the Assyrians defeated the northern kingdom. The Assyrians carted off a lot of the Israelites, a lot of the Jews, and they took them to Babylon. And they left behind the, the less skilled workers, the less important people. And, and then they brought in people from other lands to resettle into this area that would later become Samaria. And, and the, the Assyrians did this with a very clear focus in mind. They wanted to decrease nationalism, right? They wanted to kind of thin out everybody's race so that they could be one big melting pot, right? That was their goal. And, and it's very important to the Jews to remain pure and to remain faithful to God. But the people who stayed behind met married and had children with some of these, as they would say, heathens moving in from other places. And this created the Samaritans. And the Israelites and the Samaritans never got along. So much so there was even violence occasionally, right? The Samaritans didn't feel comfortable coming to Jerusalem to worship, so they built their own temple. And then the Jews went and burned it down. Because that was a heretical temple. You shouldn't be worshiping there. You're doing wrong. Okay, the bad blood here was serious. Okay, and the hostility was very real. But even though this hostility exists, Jesus says he has to go to Samaria. Now, I've got to be honest with you, I think this probably confused his disciples, and I think this probably wasn't the only time his disciples were a little confused by the actions of Jesus, right? Because Jesus didn't come to fulfill all of our expectations of Messiah, did he? Jesus didn't come to give us what we wanted or even what we thought we needed. He came to give us what we really needed. And I thank him for that. But the reality of it is, Jesus came to turn the world on its, on its ear, turn it on its side. He did all kinds of things, breaking with cultural norms. Right? He, he challenged those traditions. 
That's one of the reasons the Pharisees were his great enemies, because the Pharisees felt they had the divine power to be the keepers of the traditions, right? Are traditions bad things? No, not at all. Everybody has traditions. Every church has traditions, right? Kind of irritates me when churches call some services the traditional service and others the contemporary service. The reality is all worship is contemporary because it's happening right now. And all worship has traditions. They just might be different traditions. Again, are traditions good or traditions bad? Neither. It's just a stone. What are we going to use our traditions for? If we use our traditions to exclude people from the kingdom of heaven, you're using your traditions like a weapon. And this is not pleasing to the Lord. Or we can use our traditions to help people feel comfortable, to know what's coming next, to help them feel comfortable about the things they can be comfortable in so we can confront the things in life that need confronting. That's when we're using those stones of tradition to build the kingdom of God. Jesus chose the rockier road. Again, I'm not talking about rockier road as in a more difficult journey. I'm talking about full of more stones. Potential stumbling blocks. Why? Because he had a divine appointment. Verses 5 and 6 in this little story here. Verse 5 starts, So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the property that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about six in the evening. I tell you, this was a, this was a place that was just full of history for the Jewish people, full of history for Israel, right? And, and, and they stop there, and they, take, and they just want to take a break. Why? Because they're tired. I, I've never journeyed on my feet as much as Jesus and the disciples did, have you? I mean, I walked a lot as a kid, I guess, compared to my parents, but now I'm not a kid. I don't walk as much anymore. They walked everywhere, right? They didn't have cars. So I don't know about you, but if I'm walking a journey, would I I prefer to walk for three or four days, or would I rather walk for seven or eight days? Of course, I'd rather walk for the lesser amount, even if I wasn't in a hurry. I mean, the scenic route is nice when you're in a nice air conditioned or heated car, but on your feet, sometimes it kind of is difficult. But they went the direct route, not to make life easy, but because Jesus had a divine appointment. I, I want to talk a little bit about what time it was. This Holman Christian Standard translation that I preach from, I really like the translation, but I think they missed this one. The literal meaning of the Greek here in, in verse 6 is, is the sixth hour. What does the sixth hour mean? Well, it depends on how you tell time, right? The Greeks had a way of telling time. The sixth hour would mean six hours since 12, kind of how we keep time, right? It could have been 6 a.m. or it could have been 6 p.m. That's the Greek way of doing things. But the Jewish way of doing things is they gauged everything off of sunrise. The sixth hour of the day, sunrises around 6 a.m. So the sixth hour of the day would be noon. I'm not going to test your math skills, but trust me on that one, okay? Right, Sandra? Okay, I, I consulted my math expert. Thank you. You know, but the reality is it's about noon, First of all, I think John's going to speak in the Jewish way of doing things, not the Greek way of doing things. And and me and a bunch of other biblical scholars, so you don't think I'm getting, you know, too big for my britches here. Most folk really believe this is happening around noon. What happens in the desert at noon? It's hot. So what happens? As little as possible. It's time to think about siesta, not thinking about doing hard work. And so Jesus is lounging around at this well. He sent the disciples into town. Why did he send them on that little errand? Because I don't think that Samaritan woman would have been too keen about seeing 13 Jewish men sitting there around that well. She just would turn around and go home. But he sent them Jewish boys into enemy territory to go find kosher food. (laughs) Good luck with that. He knew they'd be gone a while because he had a conversation he had to have. Jesus had a divine appointment. Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. How wonderfully human of Jesus, right? As as believers, as Christians, we spend a lot of time trying to convince people that Jesus was divine, right? The incarnation means Jesus was 100% human. But sometimes we go so far that direction we forget he was also 100% man. 
He got tired just like we do. He probably got blisters on his feet if he walked too much. When he was a carpenter swinging that hammer, man, he got tired. He's probably a very strong man because of it, but he was just as human as the rest of us are. And I tell you, I think that's good news. There's a kinship between Jesus and every weary pilgrim making his, his or her own way through life who, who drops tiredly into the nearest chair after an exhausting day, right? You ever done that? Sure, we all have. And Jesus was tired. And so where does he wait? He doesn't wait at some place of magnificence or some place of grandeur. He waits at the well. I mean, that's kind of like, you know, you don't expect anything divine and glorious and wonderful to happen at somewhere so mundane and plain, right? It's like you don't go to Walmart to find Jesus, do you? Well, I hope so, because you take him with you everywhere you go. But we don't expect God to do wonderful things in Home Depot or in Lowe's or in Piggly Wiggly or wherever. No, we expect big things happen in places like churches, right? Right? at the feet of crosses, and and God can work that way. But let me tell you, God is everywhere. And God had a divine encounter with this woman. See, verses 7 through 9 is when the stone shows up. I'm talking about that Samaritan woman in Jesus. That's not a very nice way to talk about people, talking about them as a rock. Well, guess what? They were for each other. Because it's noon, right? Right? The well is a place in, in the Judean countryside, of a, it's a place of, of, of gossip, it's a, a place of fellowship, it's a place of finding out what's going on in everyone's life, it's, it's just a good place to hang out and talk and see how things are. And so all of the women of the village would probably go to the well at about the same time so they could meet everyone, so they could talk, so they could visit, so they could have some good conversations. Some people say that they would go first thing in the morning so that they would have water for washing at the beginning of the day and for breakfast. And some people said they'd go at the end of the day so they'd have water for washing up after a hard day's work and for dinner. I don't know. I wasn't there. Maybe they did both. But one thing I do know is at noon, they're not hauling around water. It's heavy. But this Samaritan woman goes at noon. Why? She didn't want that fellowship. She didn't want that time together. She doesn't, she's going to be the butt of all the jokes anyway, so she'd just soon not be there. And so she goes at the most inopportune time so that she can do this alone. As a matter of fact, I would even, I think this is probably a part of her day she looks forward to because she can get out of town. She can get away from all of those staring eyes. She can get away from all those people looking at her and whispering about her to whoever was standing close. She was probably looking forward to a little bit of time by herself and boom, there's this Jewish dude sitting there. What now? And Jesus looked at her and responded in what I think is the only way that he could possibly make her open to having an experience with the Lord. He responded to her in a way that didn't throw up these barriers and throw up these walls. He he didn't see that stone and try to use it as a weapon. He He didn't want it to be a stumbling block. He didn't even want to climb over it. He wanted a confrontation in the most holy way possible. Because he wanted to use that stone to build a stepping stone, not only for this woman, but for everyone through her. And he simply asks her a simple question, right? It's very simple. There's nothing deep and theological sounding in it, is there? Give me a drink. And as soon as he did that, he had that Samaritan's woman's attention. You know why? Because this just isn't the way things are done. Excuse me, sir, I don't think you know the rules. We don't do it that way here. First of all, men don't speak to women in public, not even their own wives. Not even their own children unless they're doing something so drastically wrong that they must be corrected in front of everyone. Men just don't do that. Aren't you glad it's not that way anymore? I am. 
But back then, that's just not the way things were done. So immediately, this Samaritan woman goes, whoa, what is wrong with this dude? Something's up. He's not right in the head or something. Maybe he's gotten overheated and really needs some water, right? But then there's the second dimension of things. Not only was this man talking to this woman in public, this Jewish man was talking to this Samaritan woman in public. (gasps) How dare he? I see this as a real stone kind of an opportunity. What would have happened if a Pharisee had stumbled upon this scene? He would have used that stone and started throwing it as a weapon. I know you're not a godly man now, Jesus, because how dare you? But Jesus didn't come to give us what we were expecting. Jesus didn't come to fill our felt needs. He came to actually give us what we really, truly need. And he chose to use that encounter with this woman as a way to build the kingdom of God. I mean, this, this wasn't the result of some kind of a, a conference that Jesus went to on cross-cultural evangelism. He hadn't developed a theology for reaching the Samaritans. That would be the 21st century solution to these things, right? I've been to those conferences. They're not bad. But that's not the real answer either. You know what the real answer is? We need to go out into this world and we need to meet people's needs. We need to give a cold cup of water in the name of Jesus Christ. You need to give a meal in the name of Jesus Christ. You need to give a helping hand, a kind word, a smile. Oh, that goes so far. And how did the Samaritan woman respond? Again, she was absolutely amazed. And again, John here points out for his Greek readers, he says, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Again, helping that Greek audience kind of understand where Jesus is coming from here. Let me ask you a question. What's the first thing that comes to mind when a stone is in your path? What I mean when I say that, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you encounter somebody who is different from you? It could be a racial difference. It it could be a gender difference. It could be a stylistic difference, how they're dressed. It could be an age difference. It could be a socioeconomic difference. It it could be all kinds of potential differences there, right? Because the reality is all of us are different anyway, but we tend to clump together in, in, in folks that are like each other, right? Is there anything necessarily wrong with that? No. Unless that's all we do. If that's all we do, we're not really fulfilling the Great Commission, are we? Go ye therefore, where? And share the gospel with people just like you. No, it's not there. I've had some people try to convince me it was, but it's not. That's a stumbling block sometimes. When we see somebody coming and our first thing isn't there is the image of God. No, our first thought sometimes can be vastly different from that, can't it? Sometimes it's in, in, in ways that are really not that big of a deal, even kind of funny. Oh, I'm an Auburn fan. They got on an Alabama cap. I ain't talking to them. And we can say that in jest, but if that's really how we feel deep in our hearts, we got a problem. That's a stumbling block for us. The reality is there are a lot of things that could divide us, but only if we let it. There's only one thing that can truly unite us, and that's God. We can all be united under the banner of Jesus Christ. We can all be united as children of God. That's using the stones in our life to build up instead of to tear down. What would happen if we Christians let Jesus teach us on how to handle stones? Awesome and amazing things could happen for the kingdom of God. Jesus encountered many stones, people, in his lifetime, just like we do. And he had the same choices that we have when we encounter these stones. Right? The choice is, will we throw it? Will we seek an opportunity to attack someone who is different from me? Will we stumble upon it? Will we pay so much attention to those differences that we don't see God in them? Will we climb over it? Sounds good to climb over a barrier in your life, right? Maybe. But why are you climbing over it? Are you climbing over it to get to the other side or so you can tell everybody that you climbed over it? 
Or are we going to do our best to use that stone to build up the kingdom of God? Because let me tell you, each and every one of us is important in God's kingdom. None of us can do this thing called life on our own. Life is a team sport. It's not an individual event. Yes, I need to be everything I can be for the kingdom of God. You need to be everything you can be for the kingdom of God. But we gather together. We gather together an institution called the church so that we can be more effective in our work for the Lord. And when the church walls turn into barriers to keep people out, instead of things to unite us together in one common goal, we're doing it wrong. I've asked you this question before, and I'm going to ask you this question again, because it's important, I feel. What would you do if somebody walked through that door that caused that anger to flare up inside of you? What would you do? You know, what would you do if Joe Biden or Donald Trump walked through that door? If you care about politics, one of those two guys would make you angry. Would you welcome them, or would you start casting stones? What would you do if a homosexual couple walks in holding hands? Cast stones or build the kingdom? I'm not saying that we ignore sin. I'm not saying that it changes what's right and what's wrong. That's clearly spelled out for us right here. But I am saying we have to love everyone. And we need to speak in love to everyone without condoning their decisions they make. What happens if you go to church and you say the wrong word? What happens if you go to church and you spill something on the carpet? What happens if you go to church and do something wrong? Many times you get fussed at. What happens if you go to the bar and do say something wrong or go to the bar and spill something? You get love and encouragement. Why? That's so wrong. Sometimes the world does a better job of loving on the world than we do. I'm sorry if that's hard. I'm sorry if that's tough. I'm sorry if that steps on your toes because I've been stumping mine on these stones all, all week. And the reality of it is, though, we need to be servants for the kingdom of God in everything that we do. Today's challenge is really twofold. Our challenge is when we see a stone, we need to use it for the benefit of the kingdom of God. Our challenge is we look outward into the world that we live in. What are we going to see first? Are we going to see the image of God or are we going to see somebody who disagrees with me for one reason or another? That's our challenge, folks. And if we're really truly going to build the kingdom of God, we don't need to be throwing these things. We need to be building with them. Our hymn of invitation today is very appropriate. It says, wherever he leads, I'll go. If he leads you to Samaria, go. If he leads you to enemy territory, go. If he leads you to a place where you might feel uncomfortable when you get there, go. Not because it's enemy territory, not because it might make you feel uncomfortable, but because we must be obedient to Jesus Christ. We must respond to the Holy Spirit's call upon our lives and go where he leads. And if you want to go with, the, with, with rocks in your pocket, with stones in your possession, make sure you're going to build and not to tear down. Because the work of the Lord is a work of love. Sometimes it's confrontational love, but it's always motivated by love. So let's go out there and anytime we encounter something that could be an impediment, that could be something that diverts us or makes us stumble, let's respond in love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord, and we again just thank you so much for the many gifts and blessings you give us every single day. Help us, Lord. Help us to love you with everything that we have. Help us, Father, to obey you no matter what. And help us, Lord, to be builders. Builders of your kingdom. Not our kingdoms, not our towers, but yours. And help us glorify you in everything 
that we do. It's in your holy, wonderful, and amazing name we pray, Lord. Amen.